Welcome to the Behind the Grantmakers Curtain Series. This collection of interviews with different foundations aims to help grant seekers craft more effective grant proposals that win funding. This series is brought to you by Instrumental, the institutional fundraising platform. If you're looking to bring grant prospecting, tracking, and management to one place, you can do so with Instrumental. On average, nonprofits apply for 78% more grants within a year, helping them win more grants. To do the same and find new good fit funders for your nonprofit, try Instrumental 14 days free by visiting www.instrumental.com. That's www.instrumental.com. Now, let's jump into today's show. Today's conversation features the Director of Programs at a community foundation based out of Wyoming. We explore a variety of topics such as what is the fine balance between qualitative and quantitative when crafting an effective grant proposal, as well as different tips and tricks for building meaningful partnership and relationships with different foundations and other organizations within a community. It's an insightful one, and I hope you'll enjoy this episode. I'm so excited today for our conversation with the Wyoming Community Foundation. For over 30 years, the Wyoming Community Foundation has connected people who care with, uh, with causes that matter to building a better Wyoming. The foundation has granted nearly $100 million to charitable causes while also providing a variety of supports to nonprofit agency fund holders. Today, I'm pleased to bring Micah to our conversation as Micah Richardson is the Director of Programs at the Wyoming Community Foundation. She she enjoys learning about the incredible nonprofits across the state and being a resource to nonprofits and donors focused on making Wyoming a better place. She earned her bachelor's degree in K-12 art education, and then after a few years in the classroom, she found herself drawn to the nonprofit world, and since 2010, Micah has been supporting Wyoming nonprofits through her work. Micah, we're so excited to have you here today, and I'd love for you to kick us off by telling us a little bit more about your foundation, such as its origin story and who you aim to fund today. Sure. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to have a chat with you today. I'm excited about it. Um, so the Community Foundation, Wyoming Community Foundation, as you mentioned, has been around for over 30 years. We were um, established in 1989. And our founder, John Freeman, who is um, still involved with the foundation today, he stops by, he you know, loves to hear about the nonprofit work and is just an incredible man. Um, he at the time recognized that there was a need for um, some sort of a central organization that would add strength and quality to the nonprofits in Wyoming. And so he and a handful of others um, created at the time what was called the Wyoming Volunteer Assistance Program. And um, they, they pulled a number of people together to try to kind of work on this problem and um, determined that one of the ways that would be helpful would be to hold what they called philanthropy days. And it was basically a conference to bring nonprofits together and kind of increase the professional professionalism in the field. Um, and while he was at that conference, he, uh, he says he was sitting in the, um, I think it was like the Hilton bar, not having an alcoholic drink, but sitting in the Hilton bar. Um, and this gentleman named Larry Nash who um, was the manager of the U.S. West Foundation, which was a phone company back in the day, um, pulled John aside and he said, you know what you need is, um, you, need to, you need to create a community foundation. Um, at the time, John did not really know what that would look like. He didn't have much idea about what community foundations did. Um, but as they talked, he was really intrigued um, by this approach to community building. But luckily for John, there was a person who had been helping with the Wyoming Volunteer Assistance um, uh, Program. Her name was Lolly Benz Plank, and she did know about community foundations. Um, she had been involved with them in Minnesota. She and her then husband, Raymond, um, Raymond Plank. And so um, they put plans in place, accessed resources from Minnesota, accessed some resources from Colorado, and the two just kind of hit the ground running. They, um, John will tell you that they you know, would drive like six, eight hours for a one hour meeting with someone in Wyoming, we're a really large, uh, small population, but large in uh, this actual state land. Um, so they would drive all this direction for a meeting, uh, you know, bring people on board, and they started building traction um, and bringing donors in, <clears throat> and thinking that this could really happen, and they could they could build the support for nonprofits. So um, the first grant, as far as I know, was a grant actually from the U.S. West Foundation, and that was for two hundred thousand dollars. 
And as they continued to just build momentum, um, they continued to get challenge grants and bring in other donors who, who saw and believed in this idea of um, a central organization who could really help build the fabric of Wyoming nonprofits. And that's kind of where it went. And I, it turns out actually that um, Wyoming was the last state in the union to have a community foundation. So, uh, but that's, that's kind of how it all started. And we're still kicking today and um, just trying to do the best we can for, for our nonprofits and the community. Awesome. And, and overall, how would you describe your grant making strategy? So we really think about, um, you know, our, our mission of building a better community um, is really true to what we think about. So each of Wyoming's communities look different and, and, you know, certain pockets of Wyoming might have different needs than other areas. And so it is really broad, but it's based on community need. You know, when we are looking at applications, um, we think about, okay, you know, what, what, what role does this nonprofit serve in, in a certain community and um, how are they really benefiting the community and building the community? And so uh, that's where we really come from everything. Like number one, you know, are they, are they building a community need and, and helping out in that arena? And what does that process look like in terms of rank ordering, you know, what the community needs might be in this funding cycle as opposed to the next? And um, how sure. often are you guys reevaluating that or refreshing it for the next cycle? Well, again, it's, you know, like I said before, we're a small populated state. So a lot of this is, you know, hearing from the nonprofits where they, you know, they can give us that data and that information saying X amount of um, people are able to access, you know, X amount of resources. And this is why we're really important, or this is why we need your support in order to, you know, kind of help serve these people. Um, it's also a matter of um, doing our own research and finding out what, you know, right now, specifically as a lot of um, states are seeing, the, the state funding is really tight and it's even more so in Wyoming because we're also taking big hit to um, our natural resources, which is what Wyoming depends on. Um, and so, you know, doing some research to talk to people at the state level or um, who are doing Wyoming statewide work and say, what does this look like? Like, where are the gaps? What's, what's happening here? Where are the cuts coming? So we do a lot of work on our end and also really depend on conversations with our nonprofits. Um, they fill out applications for us, but we often call them and say, okay, thanks for the application. Let's talk about this a little more. Um, we've got questions on X, Y, Z. Can you fill us in? That sort of thing. Yeah, that's something I've noticed from talking to a few other foundations where a lot more foundations are being proactive about that being a two-way street in terms of that relationship building. And speaking of relationship building, I'm curious uh, with your unique situation where there's a ton of land and, necessary, and it's kind of more dispersed out, what are the most effective ways that folks are able to begin building a relationship with your community foundation uh, that you've experienced in the past few years? Well, I think this last year has been really, well, oh my gosh, two years now, go bed. Um, it's really, you know, we, I think so many of us, and I don't know if this is the case for you too, always felt like we needed to set up a meeting and then drive and meet and, you know, talk things through. And as lovely as that can be, um, it's always good to just kind of sit and have a conversation with people. We've also realized a lot more conversations have been able to happen because of, you know, technology. And so um, it can be picking up the phone, but it can also be setting up some Zoom meetings. Um, I think that it's, we have a wide array of, of speaking with people, but um, I, I think it's also just kind of a given here in Wyoming that we know it's just not always going to be easy, even if it's, you know, we can't make the four hour drive or it's like, actually you're 45 minutes away, which is really close, but the roads are closed just because of the snow. So, you know, I think, we one thing we really encourage with our nonprofits is if they have questions, call us. Like we will be happy to talk to them, and that could be as they're filling out their grant application. If they have questions and they're just kind of uncertain about, you know, you know, what exactly do you mean with this question? And we hope that we've clarified that over the years and made things streamlined and simple. But um, I think that's that is one thing that I really love about working in Wyoming and working at the Community Foundation in particular is that I. I do think we um, we do we we try to express that you know people are welcome to call and we're always here to help. 
Yeah, digging a little bit more deeply into that, I'd love for you to share in your opinion what sort of trends you've observed in terms of the, the relationships between grant seekers and grant makers, especially after the start of COVID, now we're in, in the midst of it still. Um, how has COVID potentially impacted the, the ideas around unrestricted support grants? Well, we have um, for years given unrestricted grants, so that that isn't really new um, in our neck of the woods, but um, because we recognize how important um, it is to have general operating grants. Like if you have that, that base and that structure and can find support there, that is really going to give you the legs to have a stronger organization. So we, we've been behind that always and we will continue to do that. And we're, we're happy that we are able to do that. Um, but I think, you know, it's just kind of, we all just kind of go, okay, here we go. So when we um, granted in, our last grants of 2019 then kind of rolled into 2020 and any of the grants that we um, distributed during that cycle, we automatically turned into general operating. So if an organization had, um, you know, applied for a specific program, we, if they could fill, fulfill that program and, and, you know, spend the dollars as they had hoped to, great. If they couldn't, we just said, keep it, keep it for general operating, use it as you need to. Um, there's no way that you're going to be able to figure out like what things are going to look like in the next year. Um, we, like I said, we've always, can, we've always supported the general operating grants. I think that hasn't um, ever, I think that's just kind of stayed a, a mainstay, I suppose, and something. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think, what was the other part of the question that you asked? I lost my train of thought. Yeah, it, it was just in general how you think uh, the relationship between grant seekers and grant makers has actually been changing over time, especially. Yeah, I got stuck on the general operating question. Sorry about that. No worries. No, I think um, for us specifically, I can't speak to other organizations, but we need to do a better job of um, of trying to make connections with those with those grant seekers. And we've um, tried to implement things over the years and, and really, um, I think, are aiming to be more thoughtful of it, but we can always be better. I think it takes some um, making phone calls are on our end and not just when the applications come in or not just if we have an app, a question about like where they are with things, but just to call and check in and say, hey, how are things going? Like, what are things looking like at your organization right now? Or you, you doing all right, basically. Just a, just a simple kind of check-in. And I, I'm hoping that if we continue that, process over the years, we can even build a little bit more, um, you know, trust um, with the organizations feeling like they can call us, they can tell us when they're struggling, um, those sorts of things. So that's, that's where I'd like to see things go. But I, I know we've got work to do. Sure. And on that topic of keeping in the loop um, from your guys' end, I'm curious if you could share some of the uh, most effective ways that grant seekers who have worked with you over the years have stayed in touch with um, the community foundation on the other side of the table. Sure. Well, I think a lot of them actually do pick up the call or phone a lot to make a call. So, and, and we also, you seem to run in circles, right? So if there's a conference somewhere, I'm just touching base at a conference and, and um, someone kind of throwing out an idea while we're sitting down at a table and saying like, this, this is this thing we've, you know, have, it's been rolling around in our head when we'd love to talk to you a little bit more about it, that sort of thing. So I think, I think those one-on-one -on -one conversations are just so beneficial. Um, even if we can't be of support, perhaps it's something that we can um, guide them to someone else who might be of support or another organization who it's like, oh, you know who else is doing this? There's an organization up in Gillette. You should give them a call. Like I'll connect you to them and see if it sounds like you have a lot of similar things happening, you know? And so I think, I think again, just those, those, even if they're short, sweet, um, just taking the time to kind of share what's happening on those ends too, from, from their perspective or from their uh, them initiating it as well. Ultimately, it's just the fundamentals of good relationships, right? Just right. right. In touch with each other. I know. Sometimes, though, I think, you know, we all get so busy. We have the best intentions to reach out and to share and to do. And then I think about everything that's on nonprofits' plates. Right. And they're trying to run their programming and they're trying to raise funds and they're trying to do all of these things. And it's, you know, it's sure. just, it's the best intentions. 
Absolutely. I'd love to shift gears to talk a little bit more about the application and some common things that you see there, since I'm sure you go through many of those. Um, just to kick things off here, what would you say is a very common mistake that you see a lot of grant seekers make, um, especially when applying for your guys' uh, opportunities? I would say, I, I would say the, the number one thing would be um, not explaining um, in depth or well enough as to why they are meeting community need. I think sometimes we're so familiar with our own organizations that we know what our purpose is and why we're important, but we kind of assume that others also know already what we do and why we're important. And so taking that time to really um, go in depth about this is what we do. This is how we impact community. This is why we're important now, you know, just really get into those details of of, of that connection to community and, and the value there. Yeah, I think being able to take a step back and uh, assume that the reader does not know anything is, is definitely a great way to just double check everything about the way that you're positioning your narrative. And on that point of, of narrative crafting, I'm curious if you have a particular application that comes to mind when you think about the most memorable ones that you've come across over the years. And uh, what do you think makes you know a really memorable application stand out from the rest of the pack? Yeah. Um, I'm going to real quick go back to your point of like feeling like you can step back and look at it from the other thing that we encourage um, grantees to do sometimes is to have someone who doesn't really know much about their organization read their application and can that person understand what it is they're trying to do, right? Because um, that's a good, pretty good litmus test. Um, so memorable applications, the ones that um, I feel like just, just, work so well kind of combine that need where they're sharing you know this is this is what our organization does this is the landscape of our community um and they will be sure to talk about you know concrete numbers like this many people utilize our services this is what the data says as to you know where we fill that need or where we fit in the community but then they also really talk about when talking about need, they really put some personal, um, it's it's not just a real black and white dry, right? They, they You can tell that they really care about what they do. And you can tell that they're passionate about um, either the people or project that they're working on, uh, people they're working with, project they're working on. Um, and those are the ones that I think are, are best. But it, it seems like, you know, you read it and you think, okay, this person has really thought about this and they, they fully understand what it is they're, they're asking or, or seeking, that sort of thing. Um, on the flip side, we'll get applications that, you know, the, the idea is there, but there's a spark of an idea and they kind of just throw it out there, right? And which isn't always a bad thing because that's that gets you rolling, that gets you thinking about it. But it's hard then for a board to kind of wrap their head around what exactly is this organization doing here? because it hasn't been completely mapped out or thought through or the partners haven't been kind of um, located and, and figured out yet. So those that are, are real, you can just tell they've really been thoughtful about what their, their approach is going to be. When you think about those latter applications that have the spark of an idea, but not necessarily all the component pieces, is there any trend that you've identified that is most often left out? Is it the numbers? Is it the story side? No, I think it's, it, it is just like what I said, they're like, oh, I've got this idea and I think this could be really cool and I'm going to just roll with it. But maybe I, I guess to your point, things that maybe are lacking from those are, have they looked to see if any other group is already doing that? So like, is there a way instead of starting this thing, could they partner with an organization who's already doing this? Um, and maybe it is like, they think it's a really good idea and they just, they know that like, this is a need but they don't have those numbers to say like it is a need and here's here here's the data to back that so it's just yeah like you said it's kind of it starts but it's just hasn't quite gotten over that hump to pull everything together and and sometimes we'll get those applications and we'll deny them and and then have a conversation of you know here's why this is why we didn't fund this and um you know think about talking to this person or that person that sort of thing and, and trying to again steer I'd love to hear that uh, uh, that side of things as well in terms of when uh, an applicant is denied, what are some 
uh, productive ways that those applicants have been able to continue the conversation with you guys. Because I know that applicants sometimes have a little bit of hesitation in asking for feedback and uh, different foundations have different policies around what sort of feedback they're able to give as well. Um, so I'm curious to hear what sort of advice you might offer for folks who haven't necessarily been awarded with uh, a grant from a particular foundation, but they want to get that feedback. What's the most productive way for them to do that? Um, we, you know, on our um, letters that go out that that uh, inform people that they weren't awarded, we invite them to give us a call if they want to talk about it. And knowing that some people just aren't going to call because they're nervous about it, there have been times where we thought, okay, them because this is, we really feel like we need to have a broader conversation about why this wasn't funded. There are also times where we weren't able to fund, fund them in the, um, perhaps the amount that they wanted. So we want to let them know like, hey, we thought this was a really great application. We just don't have the funding available. A lot of our funds are specific to different um, areas of the state. And so it might be a conversation like that too. Like, this is great, um, apply again, but you know, you might think about adjusting your request because this is what our funding looks like in that area, that sort of thing. Um, uh, but when we talk with an organization who's been denied funding, it, it can be it can be a wide range of things. We're, we try to be very open and honest. Um, if our board discussed that they had concerns, um, let me think uh, about um, sustainability, right? So we can talk to them about okay, this this was the concern. Um, our board is you know just as worried that you know how will this be continued and sustained into the future? Have you thought about additional partners as you move forward? You know, once you get a couple of these things in place, we'd love for you to reapply, that sort of thing. We also have some local boards who, sorry to interrupt you about to ask, say something else. We also have some local boards who have some more kind of um, specific things that they typically like to, or committees, I should say, that they typically like to fund, that they have a preference for. And so um, we never want to tell an organization, you know, don't apply this doesn't really align with this committee's thoughts, but we also want to let them know they typically, you know, prefer to fund XYZ sorts of sorts of organizations or applications. Got it. And when you're working through that evaluation process, I'm curious how your foundation approaches that and whether or not you guys have been changing uh, your guys' approach over the years, and if so, in what ways? Sure. We um, really try to keep things as streamlined as possible. I think we, you know, when we, if we're going to add a question, is it a question that is really neat? I mean, it has to be a question that we're definitely going to use that will help us make that decision, right? Not just another question because it would be kind of nice to know this thing, sort of, you know, those are, those are things we can do in the follow-up. So we try to keep it um, focused on, on the same way that we will be evaluating. So what is your community need? Who are the partners that you're going to be working with? Um, can you leverage your dollars because of the partners that you're working with? Um, what does this project look like? Why is it important? What are, and who, are, who is the population that this is going to impact? Um, those core questions are really what we need, um, along with financials, to see that you're, you know, you're happy where you are, if you if you aren't healthy, what that might look like. Um, but those are what we are going to be looking at when we're evaluating. So those are the core questions we stick to. Um, and and I, you know, a lot of a lot has been said about trust-based grant making. And I that um, along with that is you know trying to keep that application pretty simplified and um, recognizing that the, the nonprofit is the expert in their field and um, there's got to be some amount of trust there for us to move forward to make a grant um, without getting into the nitty gritty, the weeds, all of those things. Before we head into the second portion of today's conversation with Micah Richardson, we wanted to tell you about Instrumental. Instrumental helps grant seekers bring grant prospecting, tracking, and management to one place. If you'd like to give Instrumental a try, you can create a free account at www.instrumental.com and get personalized grant recommendations for your nonprofit. In the case where you're ready to upgrade your account, you can save $50 off your first month for listening by using the code FOUNDATION50. Nonprofits that use Instrumental increase their grant applications by 78% within a year of using us. Now, back to the episode. 
On the topic of financials, I'm curious if you can speak a little bit more about some of the budgets that you see and what those look like. I know that folks, especially those newer to, to grant writing, often struggle when it comes to making an effective budget. So uh, what general thoughts do you have to share there in terms of what you've seen in terms of all the different applications over the years? We see a wide variety of budgets. So we have a template that people can use if they would like to. Um, but I mean, we have tiny organizations who are in, you know, towns of like 500 people and their the resources to of their organization are volunteers who are, you know, trying to help this small organization fill the needs in the community. So we have received check ledgers, which we through with the person. And if, if that's, you know, we, we try to meet the organization where they are and we recognize that certain organizations capacity, their or that capacity is not going to look like another organization's capacity, right? So if you have a robust nonprofit that has the staff and, um, you know, we have, we have an expectation that those are going, that you're going to send your financials and they are going to be in the right order. That's, we also realize that those itty bitty nonprofits who are asking for, you know, $1,500 to help with a sign, we can look at that a little bit differently, right? Um, our goal is to help them um, kind of keep things in order and let them know what we need so we can guide them so that when they do go to ask for additional dollars from another organization, you know, they've got what they need in order. So um, it's it's varied. Uh, we, uh, like I said, we will accept whatever the organization has for their financials. If we are uncertain about um, any part of it, we um, follow up and ask questions about it. Um, sometimes we get duplicate things that they, you know, not quite understanding that one is one thing, one is the other. And so again, we'll reach out to them and say, this is what we need. Um, and just do our best to kind of walk through with them. If it's a, if it's a young organization or just a real small organization who hasn't had that experience um, be able to just kind of guide them a little bit. Got it. A lot of it all comes back to the theme of staying in contact on both ends in terms yeah. of the entire process. Yeah. Um, something I'm curious about exploring a little bit further as well is I'm sure that given that you guys have such a broad impact in the overall um, community, that there are some opportunities in which you're renewing grant applications. And I love to hear about how your foundation reviews renewing grant applications, if it's different from new ones, and um, if there's anything that's important in terms of you know, reporting-wise that uh, you would give as advice for folks that are looking to renew their, um, their past funding sources and things like that, and um, just in general, how you approach you know, renewals as opposed to new grantees. Sure. We, um, so we have a few larger grants that we have made that we have partnered on um, that are statewide and that need kind of like a, a federal match or a larger match for a larger, um, broader uh, uh, program, that sort of thing. And those we have multi-year grants on. For, the, um, for our competitive cycle, we do not do just renewals. They have to apply each year, which can be frustrating for an organization who frequently just, you know, they apply, we grant the money, we apply, we grant the money. And part of the reason for that on our end is the, the way that we are structured. So we have um, a multitude of different funds, and then we have six local boards, our statewide board. So different organizations, like our, um, for example, our CASPER local board makes decisions on those grant applications that come in and impact the CASPER area, right? So when we have so many moving parts and limited um, unrestricted dollars as well, it can be a little tricky to do multi-fund grants and keep it straight and then uh, review some of those new applications from organizations that we haven't seen before. And so that is something we've talked about in the past about like, you know, if, if we are in support of this organization, why not a multi-year grant? And that that's one of the things we've talked about is just the the actual um, difficulty of making sure we can keep all of those things straight. And, and so I, at this point, um, people just will reapply as they need. And then new applications, you know, typically we have a lot of questions about because we're not familiar with the organization. So a lot of follow-up work and that sort of thing. But okay. your question. Got it. Um, in terms of 
last thoughts. I, I'd love for any final thoughts that you think would be helpful to share to help out any of the grant seekers that are listening today. Sure. Um, for our community foundation in particular, I think one of the things that um, that when we're looking at, at grant applications that have been really successful or that we're really excited about, there are typically multiple players involved. So it's an organization who sees the need. They also see another organization who is kind of working similarly, or maybe you wouldn't think they are working similarly, but can come together to try to make movement and progress on an issue. And um, when we see that happen, it's it's pretty cool, especially when you know I think about we have a lot of local programs, but when we see something like that happen on a statewide kind of in at that scope, that's that's pretty exciting too. So I think um, I think people who are applying for grants shouldn't uh, take for granted, like really really share with the partnerships that you have and and how you're trying to work together um, to benefit whatever you know topic it is you're trying to tackle or community that you're trying to support. I think that's always it's always great to see those partnerships and see them thriving. You just it's it's cool. So yeah we actually had a workshop a few months ago around the importance of partnerships uh, with one yeah. of our presenters as well because it's such a frequently overlooked area since so many organizations are often looking within as opposed to looking within the community uh, which can really expand the bandwidth and opportunities for everybody as well yeah and it can be tough i mean right to try to get multiple organizations focused on one um program or project it's not always easy and sometimes it fails and that's okay too. Like it's, I mean, one of the really cool things about being a community foundation is we can take risks on things that we hope succeed and have a ton of potential, but they may not. And that's okay. You know, that's that's part of us learning as an organization and seeing like, oh, this didn't quite work and why didn't it work? Or wow, that worked and this could probably be replicated elsewhere. And let's see what that looks like. So that's, I mean, that's what, I get excited about is some of those things. Totally. And I think the grant seekers that are listening can apply that same approach to how they work on their proposals in terms of yeah. the, the narrative crafting, the balancing of the quantitative and the qualitative. Um, mm -hmm. Those are some great takeaways. Micah, thank you so much for joining us today. If yeah. our listeners would like to learn more about uh, the Wyoming Community Foundation, they can visit their website at wycf.org. This concludes our conversation with Micah Richardson, the Director of Programs at the Wyoming Community Foundation. If you enjoyed this conversation with this grant maker, be sure to check out the other ones in our series. And if you haven't already, be sure to sign up for an instrumental account to get personalized grant recommendations for your nonprofit. Just access www.instrumental.com to see your results today.